My name is Oluwaleke Ayodele Ilo, and I am an under 40 CEO. The African Renaissance. The concept that the African people and nation shall overcome the current challenges confronting the continent and achieve cultural, scientific, and economic renewal is here and with young men and women taking the lead. Some call them the new school heroes. We call them under 40 CEOs. Many may remember him as a rapper from the music group The Tribe, led by Larry Dabiri, also known as LD The Don, and many others may remember his voice on radio as on-air personality at Classic FM in Lagos, Nigeria. What many may not realize is that he is now the managing director at the Ivy College in Lagos. Oluwale Keilo initially pursued a degree in medicine at Lagos University Teaching Hospital in Nigeria before leaving for the University of Portsmouth in the United Kingdom where he got his first degree and subsequently he attended University of Leeds where he bagged his master's degree in education management. Okay, welcome to Under 40 CEOs, Mr. Lee no? Thank you very much, sir. Now, you're a man who has experimented with media, music, uh, medicine even, but ended up a fine teacher. How did you get here? It's been a long and interesting journey. Um, I cut my teeth on music quite early, but by the time I was finishing university, I went to the University of Portsmouth. I studied entertainment technology. That was my first degree. By the time I came out of university, um, I had been educated. So my parents had started the school prior to me going to university. And when I finished, um, my mom coerced, bullied, pleaded, did everything possible to get me to come over into the school. I was a little bit reluctant at first. And kind of counterintuitively, um, I stayed back in the UK but as soon as I was offered a job in the UK, I felt validated. I, I no longer felt like I was in a position where I was taking a handout or um, I was being offered the job because I couldn't get anything else. So at the point where I was supposed to start the job in the UK, it was with Fujitsu Siemens. Um, I hopped a plane and I came to Nigeria and I started working in Diary College. So to the business of education, how different is it from a regular business? The, the primary difference with education and all other businesses is that with education, um, you're in the business of impacting lives. Your, your product that you put out, your finished product is an educated individual. It's someone who can go out into the world of work and earn their keep. It's someone who can um, replicate themselves. It's someone who is confident. It's someone who is caring. It's, it's a variety of things, and we're not just catering to um, educational needs. So it's, well, we're not just catering to academic needs. We're catering to educational needs. So there's a social education, there's a spiritual education, there's a financial education, there's a physical education, there's a sexual education, there's a parental education. There's so many different types of education, and we need to look at it very holistically in order to achieve a finished product. One of your objectives at the Ivy College is to make uh, pre-university international education affordable to Nigerians. Now, how affordable is it at the moment? I think we put ourselves in a position where we are affordable. Um, our scales of fees are not fixed. So, for example, um, at our Otta campus, people who live within a certain geographical area are presented with a different bill from people who live outside of that catchment area. It may seem counterintuitive to some people, but we look at it as offering value added. We want people in our local community to be positively affected by our school, and we realize that the desire line of the school goes outside of our local catchment area. So we, we try to put ourselves in a position where anyone who wants to send their children to DIV College can really afford to do so. In addition to that, we offer um, means-based scholarships, which has to do with the ability of parents to pay. We offer SOS scholarships, which has to do with how, how well adjusted the candidate is. And we also offer complete scholarships for people who are simply unable to afford to pay the fees, 
but whose intelligence and whose intellects says to us, these are people who we need to help to get to the next level. Now you have a master's degree in uh, education management. That's from the University of Leeds in the United Kingdom. How has this helped in the restructuring um, of the business as the business evolved since you took over as the CEO? Naturally, the business has evolved. Um, no matter how similar two people are, even twins are different. Um, so by the time I took over as a CEO and MD of the college, I had my own ideas. Um, a lot of them were ideas that I, I had nurtured before going for my master's. And going for my master's gave me the opportunity to focus those ideas and to be able to present those ideas in, let me say, in a coherent, academic and business-like fashion. It's one thing to understand something intuitively, and it's quite another to be able to explain that thing and to be able to carry those around you along and let everybody catch a glimpse of the future that you see. It was very challenging because um, this is how we've always done it, is a phrase that we hear time and time and time again. And it's one of the things, to my mind, that is very dangerous in running a business. This is how we've always done it. Because change is constant, the environment will change, the clientele will change, especially in a school, the clientele will change. Every single year, the clientele of the school changes. So we needed to change with the times, we needed to look at what it is that we offer to our clients, and we needed to be able to adapt. And that process of growth, that process of adaptation, is something that can be painful. You know, we talk of growing pains in a child, we talk of teething fever, and I think DIV College went through some of those processes. We had growing pains, we had teething fevers, but to the glory of God, we have been able to weather the storm, and now we're in a position where the future is bright, um, and, and I see that. And a lot of my colleagues, a lot of my closest colleagues, the management team, the senior management team, they also see that. They buy into the vision, and I think we are perfectly poised to take the school into the next level. This is Under 40 CEOs. For men who leads an organization that understands the value of money to people in different catchment areas and helps ensure that different social classes are able to afford schooling at the Ivy College, I need to understand what the value of money is to him. Now, you once said, and I, I would like to quote you, um, that virtually all of real money in the world today is really virtual money. Now, what does money mean to you and how do you perceive money? Um, I, I won't disagree with that, but I'll say this, and it's an epiphany that I had, and it goes back to that thought. It's an epiphany that I had only a few weeks ago that um, our Lord Jesus Christ said, you should love your neighbor as yourself. You should love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your soul, with all your strength, and you should love your neighbor as yourself. These are the first two commandments, and no other commandments greater than these. Now, in the ideal society, therefore, is it that everybody would have enough money? Well, to my mind, no, that's not what he meant because in the ideal society, money as a concept wouldn't even exist. If you loved your neighbor as yourself, money wouldn't exist at all because if he needs a coat, you give him a coat. If he needs a shoe, you give him a shoe. If he needs food, you give him food. That's how I see it. So I see it as a means to an end. I see it as, as a way of liberating people. I see it as a way of breaking poverty cycles. I see it as a way of um, allowing people to, to realize their potential so that we can all live as human beings with basic decency, with the things that we, we, we require to be able to, to live, to be. That's how I see it. Okay, you've lived in the United Kingdom for quite a bit, um, and I know you're very well traveled. Now, how has the travel and interacting with diverse cultures and people impacted on you as a person? Certainly educationally, one of the things that it does is it gives me a very can-do attitude. And I think it gives me uh, 
a sense of excellence, a spirit of excellence, a sense of refusing to be mediocre. Um, th those are some of the values. I think one of, one of the other very, very key values it's given me as an individual, which kind of feeds into my love for education, is the idea that we are, we are all relevant and society as a whole um, needs to be able to cater for every member of society. What am I talking about? If, if you've been to the UK, if you've lived in the UK, you'll be familiar with the idea that, look, both the rich and the poor, the bond and the free, if you like, everybody go to the supermarket to do their shopping. When you get to the supermarket, everybody's there. The rich are there, the not so rich are there, the middle class are there, the upper class are there. So we, we, we have this breaking down of barriers. It's coming to Nigeria, but it, I think it needs to come to Nigeria a lot more. Um, also, because of that, you find out that there's no looking down your nose at one group of people who are in a particular profession or a particular business. You know, um, if you work as a, a waitress or a domestic help, or, or if you're into driving for, for, your, for your wages, whether it's as a personal driver, whatever it is, where you have a society where there's a minimum wage and that, that wage is a living wage, where you have a society where people can break out of poverty cycles, where you have a society where there are opportunities, where you have a society where there are chances, I think it, it opens minds and expands horizons. And I think that that's one of the key things that growing up in the UK has done for me. Um, I think besides that, the, the level of expertise that I have been exposed to, both in terms of teaching staff at school and in terms of teaching staff of the various universities I've attended, I think has been par excellence. So when you combine all of those things, um, I think that is what made, has made me the man that I am today. Now, you once tweeted, Nigeria is a beautiful country. The only problem is Nigerians. Now, what is the problem with Nigerians? Nigeria has been independent since 1960. We have lots of examples to look out for. There are other African nations that have been independent for years and years and years, and they have other examples to look out for. The things um, that our country needs there's, there's a song by, by some, someone we both know, um, you know, Mr. Larry Dabry. The things that our country needs are things that are available. Politicians, leaders, government officials, go abroad, see how things work, come back, and don't implement the policies that they see working abroad. And I wonder why. And it begs the question why we do things like that. Famously, uh, you know, a random example is um, toll gates in Nigeria. There's a, there's a toll gate that charges based on what type of car you drive. So if you drive a saloon car, it charges you one amount. If you drive an SUV, it charges you another amount. Now, that may seem reasonable, but on what basis do we make that reasonable? Because I've seen a toll gate in the United Kingdom whereby you are charged based on the displacement of your engine. So if you have a 1.8 liter engine, you may be charged different, but if you have a 2.4 liter engine, to me that makes more sense because it has to do with the amount of pollution, has to do with the weight of the car. An SUV, for all you care, may have the same number of seats, may have a smaller engine than a saloon vehicle. So why should it be charged more to go through a toll gate? There are loads of examples of things that we do here which we should have learned better as a nation, as a people, as a civilization, and as a culture by now. And I am not persuaded that the reason why we haven't learned or why we haven't improved is because 
maybe there's someone who's trying to prevent us from doing so. I think a lot of it has to do, sadly, with our makeup. And it worries me. Mr. Lake Law mentioned teething problems at the Ivy College earlier, and it got me wondering what kinds of challenges a school business could possibly face. We all run into challenges uh, as a business. Um, what was the last challenge that you ran into and how did you resolve it? Um, the last challenge that I ran into was based on the publishment of our last staff appraisal. Um, every year the college carries out an appraisal of every single member of staff. We do academic appraisal, we do um, psychological evaluation. And there were certain members of staff who I felt underperformed. Um, and because they did, I was in a position where I needed to sit down with each individual member of staff and explain to them um, that certain areas of their performance were satisfactory and certain areas of their performance were unsatisfactory. One particular member of staff was very vocally and very visibly upset um, and threatened to leave. I called his bluff. Um, that's how I handled that particular challenge. And I sat there thinking to myself, if this gentleman decides that he's going to leave, where am I going to start looking for a replacement? How am I going to find a replacement? But you know what, at that particular point, I thought, if we're going to get better, if we're going to move forward, he needs to come on board. There can only be one captain for the ship. Everyone else needs to advise the captain positively, um, obey, support, encourage the captain. This is Under 40 CEOs. Yes, you were just talking about your, your staff, and we all know that uh, human resources is a key element to consider when growing an enterprise. Now, how do you hire your staff? Um, we have various processes that we go through. Um, we sometimes go on recommendations. Uh, a, lo a lot of the people who are with us have been recommended by other members of staff. So when, we, when, when the college started, um, my father was actually the one who recruited the first crop of staff. One or two of those members of staff are still with us. Those members of staff have then actively gone and recruited people to come and join our organization and also been involved in their training. Um, in addition to that, the, the job market is um, changing and the way that companies recruit their best staff is also changing. So there are some particular websites, there are some particular web services whereby professionals can make themselves known and put themselves in a position for employers to engage them. So it's, it's almost like a social media, but it's not a social media. It's a professional service that is offered. So you go into these services and you're looking for a particular person with a particular set of skills and you filter through people with those particular sets of skills. You verify that they have those particular skills and then you engage them and you invite them in. Once we have taken that first step, as shortlisted applicants. When applicants come in, they're subjected to written examinations, they're subjected to psychological evaluations, they're subjected to verbal interviews, they're subjected to a whole bunch of tests, checks and balances. And at the end of that, we then always invite the candidates to go into the classroom, interact with the students, to interact with other members of staff, to get to know the school as an organization, so that if they don't like us, they don't have to stay. Because it's one thing for, for, for me to like you, for us to like them, and it's quite another for them to decide that they want to commit themselves to us. So we, we, we try to make it a two-way street so that uh, we can have longevity and continuity in the kind of people that we employ. What values are important to you and your firm? Integrity, compassion, professionalism, and excellence. What is the current uh, business structure of your firm? Um, we, have, we have the executive director um, who, who is still active. 
Um, and then I, I am the managing director, the chief executive officer. Um, we have a board of directors. The board meets twice a term. Um, we have a principal, and then we have a vice principal academics, a vice principal admin. Um, and so those systems filter down. This is Under 40 CEOs. How does an educationist unwind and spend his spare time and resources? I have a few quick fire questions for you. What do you love to eat? Chinese food, healthy rice, dodo, um, and my new super meat, rabbit meat. How would you describe your style? Laid back, functional, smart. What are your favorite brands to wear? Timberland, um, Armani, and Ferrari. What's your favorite car to drive? My favorite car to drive is the car that I have right now. I have a Toyota Highlander V6. Your favorite travel destination? My favorite travel destination is the UK. Uh, I don't know there's really a travel destination. It's a second home, really. What's your favorite book of all time? My favorite book of all time is Lord of the Rings. What book are you reading right now? I'm reading the Bible again. What other CEOs do you currently look up to? My brother, who is the CEO of Integral, which is a marketing company. I look up to Chris Ubosi, who is the CEO of Mega Electrics. Um, I also look up to Mike Adenuga. I think he's done a fantastic job. And lastly, I'd like to ask you, what makes you happy? Um, my wife and my kids, my family, uh, knowing that all my journeys end at home with them is, is, is happiness. That's, that's why I do it. That's why I get up in the morning, go do what I do. Um, you know, for me, family is everything. Uh, I, I mean, I'm a British citizen, so when I finished university, I was very tempted to stay in the UK, but family brought me back to Nigeria. Um, and family keeps me here. So thank you for coming on Under 40 CEO. My name is Oluwaleke Ayodele Ilo. You can be an Under 40 CEO.